Okay, so thanks very much, Susanna, and welcome everybody. Uh, this is Martin from QUT. Um, I hope that you'll find this um, an interesting and informative uh, presentation, and I look forward to your questions as well. Um, so I'm one of the Associate Directors at QUT, responsible for information resources and research support, and I suppose in a way they come together quite well for this uh, presentation. Um, I'd just like to also comment on contributions from a few people, uh, Paula Cannon and also from Baden Appleyard who helped me with the presentation. You will have seen that this is the topic for today that was advertised and I'll be addressing those issues and since that's come out I just wanted to share a preamble that um, I aim to provide a supporting information to authors and research support staff including library staff on the importance of understanding the issues around and the negotiation of publisher agreements, and particularly as they pertain to obtaining copy and provision of open access. Okay, right. um, now, I thought I'd um, split the topics up this way in this agenda, looking at the publication process in general, starting broader. Uh, what are publisher agreements? Why we have them? looking at agreements between institutions and publishers, looking at some of the practices in the market space particularly, um, also addressing copyright and creative commons licensing, uh, addressing crown copyright in a brief way, looking at open access, research funders, research data uh, and the importance of negotiating. And then I thought I'd wrap out because I think a lot of people today um, are here from libraries, although not everybody is, uh, that we look at ways that libraries or perhaps other parts of the university can actually uh, support um, this area with a range of services. I'll start with the publication process and services. When an author publishes their work, they're engaging the services of a publisher to perform the publishing tasks. And the publication could be a journal article or a book or even a data set. The author generally benefits from making use of the range of services to improve the presentation of the paper and the perception of prestige and possibly the impact. Um, and publishers generally provide a range of services through their website by which authors engage the publisher. Many of these services are listed on this slide and I'll briefly, and uh, with that I'll briefly overview them. Um, this is a hybrid list of services that I developed from looking at a number of publisher websites and they provide these range of services and information. How to get published, advice to authors, how to write, There'll be information about editorial policy, ethics and responsibility, how to submit a manuscript, how to match your article with an appropriate journal. There'll be information often on open access options and limitations, processes on the deposit. There'll be information perhaps about peer review and the editorial committee, how feedback's provided, how proofs work. Any, anything in relation to data. There'll also be something about a publishing licensing agreement, which is the topic of this presentation. Many include checkboxes to categorise information. There'll also be information about indexing and abstracting um, and, and promotion, for example, uh, whether author reprints are available, so that's copies for the author, FAQs, information about royalties for books and discounts and author rights. So this is information provided by the publisher to the author, which in many ways um, um, is, is going to be a complementary information to the license agreement, or much of it could be included in the license agreement. There are quite a few publishers where you need to establish um, an account with the publisher's website to be able to view all this information so they're tracking users, or there may be other sites from publishers where this is openly available and you'll see both kinds. I've listed some examples um, of some publisher information sites 
And there are, of course, as many examples as there are publishers, and you don't have to look very hard usually to find them on the site. The information is usually available from a link called something like information for authors or author services. Even from looking at these examples, which you can do in your own time, uh, you can see that authors are faced with a lot of information from which to choose where to publish their work. So what are the publisher agreements themselves? So a key component of publishing is the publisher agreement. These are a contract between the author and the publisher, and as such, they define the services provided for the fee. And as some publishers have one agreement for all their journals as a suite, that is, all the journals are on the same agreement, while other publishers have different publisher agreements for each journal or for the imprint, which can be a brand and a group of journals. This is likely perhaps to have come about due to disciplinary differences, also reflected in publisher imprints, also for historical reasons, perhaps such as a consolidation in the marketplace. Um, also being a contract, it's important that authors read and understand the contract. They should seek assistance if unsure. And of course, being a contract means that aspects are open to negotiation. Let's look at some of the common aspects of publisher agreements. <clears throat> like all contracts, okay, publisher agreements often have features in common that are listed in the slide here. So there's parties, descriptions, right to publish. I'll explain each of those. And services should be described in enough detail to provide assurance to both parties, including the author. First of all, the author signs the publisher the right to publish the work. The author should be careful to understand explicitly if the, um, if the author retains copyright or if the publisher is contracting the copyright handover from the author to the publisher. And because copyright is automatic and it is a property which means it can be given away or sold and authors need to be aware of that. Um, exclusive or non-exclusive means that the author assigns the publisher the exclusive right to publish or not. It is generally preferable to assign a non-exclusive right, if agreeable, otherwise the author is not able to publish their own work in other ways in the future. For example, publishing research as both an article in the short form or in a book perhaps the long form. And of course, there are many variations on that. This section usually also addresses the right to reproduce or not, which contracts whether the author can legally provide copy of their own work. It is possible for an author to unknowingly restrict what they can do with their own research outputs. The author warranty is the section in which the author declares it is their own work and all contributors should be authors or otherwise acknowledged. The author also warrants that the information is correct. This implies the use of good research practice and good laboratory practice. Together, also the warranties ensure the publisher that good research ethics and academic integrity have been applied. <clears throat> the last section mentioned here is about author rights, such as the right to publish a version of the paper onto an open access repository and maybe to also share copies with colleagues. In this case, of course, costs may or may not apply. We know that for traditional publishing, the author does not usually have to pay, and readers or institutions or libraries pay to access. For open access publishing, there may be an article processing fee, APC, to receive publishing services and readers access for a fee. So why have publisher agreements? Um, because agreements provide assurances to both parties and that is they're provided the terms are mutually beneficial and satisfactory. They are important to publishers because they build the business. They are important to authors because they provide a vehicle by which to retain copyright and claim rights. Here I've provided some links to a number of publisher agreements and you should look at some of them in your own time because it prepares authors 
and librarians and research support staff to be familiar with a range of agreements as this helps you to more easily pick out any positive attributes or otherwise that you may wish to address. Here's a, a few more examples as well and um, and these have been selected to show how differences in publisher agreements on different aspects. So you should have a look at these in your own time. One of these is a license to publish. One includes a copyright transfer and the other has some other restrictions as well. One of them you need to log in to be able to see, but you'll be able to see. So now onto author publisher agreements, which is really what we're talking about mostly. Um, this is the most common type between the author and the publisher itself. And I just wanted to flag that many of these now um, include, a they include a format of checkboxes. Makes it very easy for the author to check the boxes that they think apply to them. But of course, it's very important to choose the correct options. In some ways, perhaps the presentation um, using checkboxes um, um, hides to some degree the importance of, of the options, perhaps, but it also helps them jump out for, through a quick scan. <clears throat> now, institution publisher agreements. Um, the advent of open access and researcher funding mandates has prompted some publishers to respond to try to contract arrangements at the institution level. The motivation perhaps is to apply aspects of the contract at the institution level such that institutions funded by this funding agent can be published in open access with this level of embargo, while institutions receiving funding from that research funding agency can publish open access with that level of embargo. Um, it locks, of course, the institution in when publishing and open access norms are otherwise changing. It, Publishers would generally prompt for this type of agreement if they can see benefit in improving the outcome for them. It is very important that this type of publisher agreement is considered at the appropriate level within the institution. That is by a leader with institution-wide level of delegation. Um, and, and Australian institutions have generally not made such agreements to date. Let's now look um, at some of the practices that have emerged um, in the marketplace. So the internet has provided many opportunities for publishers, authors and readers to engage more seamlessly and quickly. It's also provided the opportunity for new publishing models and businesses to develop. Authors and support staff should be aware of these opportunities and also of some of the pitfalls. Some of the aspects to look for can happen that a publisher is, is actually spamming authors and inviting them to publish. And there may be some evidence that they're using institutional open access repositories for contacts. You should look for minimal publishing history as a signal. You should look if they're often targeting early career authors. Uh, it should raise awareness if there is overnight acceptance of papers and if there's minimal feedback indicating little or no peer review. You can also search the website to look if there is evidence of an editorial committee. Again, of course, there can be um, an agreement and uh, the same principles of looking for a good aspects should apply and also with support and also negotiation that will come to. Next issue I want to talk about was copyright. Uh, so understanding copyright is central to working with publisher agreements and with publishing in general. And because copyright is automatic, it means that someone owns the expression of the words. It may be the author or authors, may be the institution or the employer or the society. It depends upon the policies under which the author is working. Also, universities and research institutions will have an IP policy and a copyright policy and often have an open access policy. 
publishing does not automatically change the ownership of copyright and many publishers allow the author or the copyright owner to retain copyright. There are some publishers that require copyright transfer to the publisher. And um, agreements may make this explicit or it may be deeply embedded within the text and authors and support staff should look for it. If a publisher demands a copyright transfer, you can try to negotiate. And if that, and if they won't, you can consider the pros and the cons of publishing with that author or with another author that may allow the author to retain copyright. And the message is to shop around. Just wanted to briefly mention Creative Commons within the context of copyright. And because licenses can be so different, it can be difficult for all parties concerned, including readers or authors, to determine what they can and can't do with published material. And so we have Creative Commons, which is an open license framework which standardizes to four attributes and presents in, um, into six licenses. This makes it easier for all parties to understand. As the Creative Commons license is provided to readers, they too can understand. And now more publishers are starting to use Creative Commons licenses. In fact, some charge a bit more for it, probably because they think they're getting less by the agreement. And that statement would really apply to um, really to open access publishers. Here are some um, examples of publishers using Creative Commons licenses. You can see the relationship here between CC Open Licensing and the open access publishers list and that method of publishing. Crown Copyright. Uh, it was stated in the objectives of the presentation that I'd be addressing this. Okay, so Crown Copyright's been around for a long time, but it's perhaps not so well understood in many circles. Um, I certainly learnt um, from doing a bit of research and talking to Baden Appleyard. Uh, for any work produced by the Crown, which can be government or statutory authority, uh, the copyright is automatically owned by the Crown for 50 years. To know when something is Crown copyright or not really requires uh, the examination of how the authority came to exist and of its governing structures. I'll refer you here to the Copyright Act and to the Ausgol website. In its application, an advantage is that the Crown owns the copyright and then publishers generally do not insist on a copyright transfer agreement because they know that won't happen. Authors do not have the right to sign away Crown copyright. Universities generally do not use Crown copyright because either they or the author owns the copyright. If it is a solution to retaining copyright, then it is retained for the Crown and not for the institution or the author. So um, it's quite a complex issue. Um, open access. So uh, this is section nine, I, and that uh, your position with respect to publisher agreements is related to your institutional policies around intellectual policy, copyright and open access. When you use Sherpa Romeo to look up publisher open access policies, you should also consider local applications such as funded policies. There are other presentations in this series more about open access in general. But uh, I've listed some points to consider, to consider the benefits of open access, your institutional open access policy, um, the Australian Research Council, National Health Medical Research Council policy, your institutional copyright policy and publisher open access policies. Now on to green open access and publisher agreements. Um, a specific aspect of publisher agreements to look out for is whether they allow the author to publish into the institutional open access repository or not. This is where the rights for authors come into play. You should be aware of what version can be made available on open access and after what embargo period. Um, here are some publisher statements on open access. 
that you can look at in your own time. Gold open access. Now, uh, many publishers offer also gold open access options. There may be a Creative Commons license as described before, or there may be a bespoke publisher agreement. You still need to check for copyright ownership, exclusive license, and who should pay. Now, the publisher agreement could mean your article is published in open access, but you do not retain copyright, and then you are not allowed to put a copy in your institutional repository. This may come as a surprise to authors and to library staff and to other support staff, because there may be a general interpretation that an open access publisher will be friendlier in those aspects, but you still need to check. Um, a brief point on research funding agencies. Um, the ARC and NHMRC, uh, of course, have both got open access policies. It's best to ensure that the open access requirements from ARC and NHMRC or your institution's own policies, for example, is not in conflict with the publisher agreement and any aspect should be negotiated before the agreement is executed. Um, a few comments on research uh, data, and it's that a growing number of publishers are offering or requiring the data set supporting the publication is also made available. And as some publishers like Nature host the data, while others may refer authors to publish with data hosting services such um, as a Figshare um, or a Dryad. There are also terms of service provided by these data hosting agents. So I've given you um, a few links there to, to have a look at if you haven't looked at them before. Um, you'll certainly see a lot of data sets related to journal articles in the Dryad service, and you'll see some in Figshare as well. On to negotiating, which is very important. <laughs> So, in general, uh, the principles of negotiation come into play uh, with publisher agreements. Um, attributes can be negotiated by the author or by someone else representing the author, or there can be some support staff providing advice to the author. P publishers want your publications as it grows their business, and so you have some leverage with them and you have choices. You need to be aware um, in negotiating that um, really everything can be negotiable. You don't want to allow um, haste or a low level of author awareness or a desire to publish to execute contracts unnecessarily against yourself. Uh, for most authors, the negotiation is between the author and the publisher. But for some institutions, they um, own the copyright and, the, and so the publisher agreements. The institution could assign the right to publish to the author, which is what happens. Here are some other points also about negotiating. Um, you can try using track changes to make changes and see how the publisher responds. You can try or insist on retaining copyright and try to exert or assist on your right to publish the also the best version of your paper possible into the open access repository within six months or 12 months after publication. If all else fails, you can consider publishing with another publisher with more acceptable terms of publication. Now, the, we have talked about the author's dilemma. You may have heard of that before. Is that they're encouraged to retain their rights, yet on the other hand, they're encouraged to publish in the high status journals. I just wanted to acknowledge that. Also, collective action will likely be required, perhaps, and I've referenced Andrew Adams. You may need to decide when to walk away. The last point I wanted to talk about today um, was about support services that could be provided um, to orders to authors. So here are some tips for research support services and staff, example for librarians. There are many things that can be done to support researchers. Universities can provide a productive partnership between the researcher, the research office and the library. 
They can give supporting web information. You can provide workshops and seminars on publisher agreements. You can provide a consultation a service through your liaison librarians or through a specialised role such as a scholarly communications librarian. You can provide assistance with understanding uh, the agreements uh, through working through them together and explaining. You can provide assistance with understanding copyright retention by working through it together and explaining. You can provide assistance with negotiations where requested. And of course, you can provide assistance with payments of article processing charges, you know, like for gold open access journals. So those are the main points um, of my presentation today.